What it is, though? It's your boy Crook, LDB, Team 100. We in here, sure. Now listen. We got another reaction video today, right? So, this is... Brandon Marshall explains why some teams are stuck in the 50s, bro. Now, with everything that's been going on within the league right now, as far as, like, you know, the coaching-wise and stuff like that, it doesn't... It's not surprising why it might seem like some teams are stuck in the 50s. Because it's just like the world has evolved over the last 20-something years. And it just seems like... In areas, we move forward, but then we're stagnant in other areas, bro. And that's just with, like, football in general. I feel like football hasn't really caught up to what basketball is doing. Like, I don't know. Players just have more power in basketball than football. So, I mean, I don't know. But we're going to get into it and see what Brandon Marshall got to say. Uh, this is also from Part of My Take. So, a shout out to them. Let's get right into it. What's the best locker room you were in, team-wise? Yeah, the Chicago Bears, my first year. I was going to say, yeah. not the last year. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, the, the first year in Chicago, I, I, I was never in a locker room like that. I never was in a, in, on a team where I looked to the sideline and said, I didn't want to let those guys down. You know, you know, there were so many times Jay and I in our offense, you know, would go three and out. And Lance Briggs, Brian Urlacher, Peanut Tillman, Charles Peanut Tillman. That defense was hard. Uh, Julius Pepper. Um, that defense was tough, uh, tough. Uh, Izzy and so many others would literally meet us halfway there and still shake our hands and say, get them next time, get them next time, get them next time. You know, every day we played ping pong. You know, we played so many games. We did so many things off the field, which made the bomb better on the field. And I think that was one of the reasons, you know, we, we folded the way we did after Lovey was gone because they disrupted that locker room. Yeah. There was nothing like that. There was nothing like that. I mean, it was it was it was it was unbelievable what Brian Urlacher and those guys created there in Chicago. So you were in two spots where that kind of happened, where uh, you know Lovey gets fired and they bring in Mark Tress and everyone loved Lovey, and then you were also in Denver when McDaniel's comes in. What I mean, both guys didn't turn out, didn't like pan out. What was the mistake that those two coaches made uh, on their first go around, where it's like they just don't get how to manage this, like right. the entire thing? Yeah. Josh McDaniels, uh, brilliant from X's and O's. There's no one better. You're going to be prepared. You're going to know what's going to happen before it happens. Uh, excellent there. I think Josh's biggest downfall during that time, that era, um, was his people skills, his leadership skills, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was the biggest thing there. Coach Trustman, I just think that he didn't have a chance because – you know, you, Lovey leaves in that locker room that I talked about, and he started doing things a little differently, opened up the locker room. He wanted to create that, you know, we're all in this together, you know, like that Google, Facebook type of work environment, which a lot of coaches are adopting that now. So he was, I would say he was early. It's just ahead of his time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then, like, you know, Coach Trustman right. and I talk all the time, and we had this conversation on his podcast, uh, you know, a couple of months He's ago. He's got a podcast? Yeah, it's, but it's yeah. more it's business and leadership. Got it. He's a professor at uh, University of Miami. He's doing some amazing things there. But, I, you know, we, we were real. We had an open conversation. Uh, and, and one of the things I said was, you know, it's probably a little too early to, you know, do the things that he did. He was trying to do with the locker room. And that you had guys that weren't buying in on the defensive side, which made it extremely hard. I, I also I, I've kind of changed my thought process on And I ain't gonna lie. That's where I feel like when you look at certain coaches and like these leagues, so like the NFL, NBA, to a certain extent baseball, right? Like a lot of times People just don't, like, like, as a leader, you have to create a system. And I feel like this because I feel like this is, like, speaking to me, is that, like, in order for you to be a leader and to be able to lead the team, first and foremost, you got to create an environment that everyone will benefit from. Now, don't get me wrong. When you have different personalities in there and then everyone starts to, you know, think about themselves or like don't think that like stuff certain stuff works 
You have to be able to make people buy into what you're selling. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm in a locker room and then I might be showing favorites. Let's say, friends, I'm showing favorites. A lot of people see that. And then it, it, it just kind of just turns the locker room over. Like, you just have to know how to make people buy. And not only make people buy in, but I feel like when you're a coach, you kind of have to feel like, okay, I work for y'all. You know what I mean? So we are putting this plan together so you guys can succeed. I'm just the one that's helping y'all. Sometimes we kind of get into the habit of feeling like, oh, you work for me. I'm the coach. You got to do what I say. When sometimes it's the other way around. You feel me? The players are the ones that's giving up their bodies. They're the ones that's getting contact, slapped upside the head, body slammed, all of that, every single play. They're the ones that's in the trenches. Sometimes you got to make them realize, like, listen, it's not about me. It's about you. What can I do to help you become the best player on the field? And that's why I think a lot of coaches really kind of like just, they just get lost in the X's and O's, just think that, oh, analytics is this. And like, oh, if we do this 95% of the time, this will, no, oh, bro, listen. Analytics don't tell you about a person's heart. Analytics don't tell you about what a person is going through the night before the game. You feel what I'm saying? Like, analytics don't tell you the whole story. You feel me? The Bears, the NFL in, in totality that like coaches can fail, but it's really the organization that fails them. I'm now starting to realize like the Bears are screwed no matter what. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I almost feel bad for Trestman at this point. I was, right. I was mean to him then. Right. But like I look back and I'm like, it's just a clusterfuck ahead of uh, on top of him. Right. So he like there was never a structure right. that was put in place to have him succeed. Well, I, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, yes, I mean, our our. There's so much to that. Yeah, yeah, I do think that the McCaskies, you know, they're so passionate and they're like football royalty, but they're so stuck in the 1950s. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And they got to get with the time. Yeah. And there's a couple organizations like that. I, I talk about the Giants that way as well. I love that organization. And, you know, a lot of people can study, like, some of the ways they move, but now it's time to progress and move forward. So the McCaskies are one of those organizations. I yeah. mean, the, the Bears are is definitely one of those organizations. It's like, all right, it's time to time to get it. You yeah. have to you have to kind of shrink your ego if you're one of the older families that's owned a team for forever. Because right. you know, when you were coming up, when you were in you know in your younger years, business was done a certain way. Yeah. Maybe you had a little success then, but you have to admit that you don't know shit about football anymore. Right. And that you need to let somebody else that's a little bit younger and has like fresh perspective come in. I think a lot of times with very rich, very successful people have a hard time doing that. Just right. like admitting that they're not, they don't have what it takes anymore yeah. and letting somebody else help them. I, for me, the McCaskies, the McCaskies is less about the football stuff because they, they let the football guys do their football thing, right? Um, it's more so like, we're talking about socks here. You know, like, oh, this is how we wore in socks for uh-huh. 50 years. Well, hell, you got these young guys that want to dress the way they want to dress. Right. They want to listen to the music they want to listen to in the locker room. And they're just trying to put people in boxes. So I, I just use that as an example. I know it's like a, it's like minute and it's really nothing, but it's literally a lot of little things that makes it uncomfortable for guys to go there. And it's it's I mean it, we joke because it's it's cliche, but culture matters. Like culture, yeah. uh, you, I'm sure you can talk about culture is like important. Culture in anything, in different, bro. you've been to, on a different teams, different locker rooms. Like culture matters a lot when it comes it's to important, playing bro. football. It really is. Full season. Right. Have you been in Mr. CC's on the corner down here? Uh, no. Where's that? I just made it up. Okay. That's like that. Miss, miss, <laughs> uh, Mr. CC's is like a little mom and pop little pizza place, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's it, and that's how the Chicago Bears yeah, are no, like they phenomenal, are. Yes. phenomenal. Yes. Like when you talk about culture, the culture is good as far as like you go in there, nice people, they're amazing. You know, you know them. Hell, they might be on the elliptical next to you working yes. out. Mr. McCaskey, George McCaskey, he parks all the way in the back, and you ask him why you parking in the back. He's because I want everybody else to park, get the first. Amazing people, you know. So, but now we're talking about a sixteen billion dollar industry. Yes. You gotta, you gotta bring in some people that really know what they're doing. Yes, it is. You're right. I've, um, I've said many times to mom. And- but also, I feel like that's like a little bit of ego for real because it's like. 
if I've been doing something a certain way for years, right? I've only done it one way. I was taught this one way. Sometimes it takes a lot of letting your ego go in order to say, okay, this way isn't working. What can I do to make it better? You have to realize that takes a lot for somebody to do that. If I know that I'm doing something wrong and I want to get better at it, it's hard for me to say, okay, I suck at this. Let me ask or let me get help or let me find somebody else who can do it. That's hard, bro. Especially when you're talking about a billionaire who has millions and millions of dollars. He's set for life. He don't really have to do nothing. Or that's probably his only business and he doesn't want anyone else to have control besides himself. There are some people that's like that. Regardless of whatever situation that I'm in, maybe the product isn't really as good as it's supposed to be. It's my product. And I'm not going to let anybody else take my product away from me or make me feel like I don't have control. That is really how some people think, man. That's how some people think. And sometimes it's selfish because you trying to take all the glory and you trying to take all, all the things that potentially can go right and you want to do it yourself instead of passing the blessing around. It might be somebody under you who's like a GM or whatever the case may be that can make better decisions than you. I mean, it's just what it is. We we just have to learn how to just, one, realize, okay, this isn't working out. What can I do to improve? And then and then just improve. Come up with a plan, just improve. But that's kind of hard for some people, bro. Pop away, it's kind of hard. The, the Bears is all they know. Right. It's the family business. Yeah. It's not like a lot of other ownership groups this is where it. it's like they made a lot of money, then they bought a team. Right. And it's almost like a toy to them. Yeah. This is it. But so yeah. That was uh, very awkward, awkward if you had been like, yeah, I dig. Yeah, I've been to CC's. C- oh, Mr. CC's <laughs> down the street. Completely <laughs> made up. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. But I believe uh, it though. sounds very familiar. Like, and you can tell with certain organizations, bro. There definitely there is one. Yeah. You can definitely I'm tell. Right before now. we transition. Definitely with some organizations. Uh, we're just messy slobs. And see, that's why I'm glad I'm a Ravens fan, bro. Everyone can say whatever they want about the Ravens, bro. The Ravens then always adapted, bro. We always done adapted to different players. The only thing that we got to get better with is our fucking play calling on offense. That's it. Other than that, culture-wise, I think throughout the span of, like, the Ravens, like, actual existence, we only had, like, what? I think we only had single-digit coaches. But whereas though, you can go to, to the Miami Dolphins. They had, like, 10 different coaches in, like, 10 years. Or like 20 years or something like that. Bro, throughout 20 years from 2000, from the minute we won the Super Bowl, we only had three, we only had, we only had two coaches. Brian Billett. And then after Brian Billett, we had John Harbaugh. Yeah. Out of t- in 20 years, we only had two, two coaches. First off, that's stability. Having stability of knowing and trusting that that person can get it done. Letting your ego aside and saying, okay, I'm going to hand it to you. I'm going to give you enough time to prepare. I'm going to give you enough time to deliver. And then go from there. That's stability. That's also putting the right people in positions to build that culture. To make sure that culture stays the way it is. The Ravens have always been a playoff team. Maybe only a few years here and there that we missed the playoffs, but we're pretty much a playoff team. Steelers, pretty much a playoff team. You get what I mean? And it's just certain franchises that you know that it starts from the leadership on down. Like, look at Miami. Miami never won nothing. Look at Detroit. Look at the Giants. Like, it's just, they. there has just never been any type of success with those franchises just because of the upper management. You can't blame that on the players. Like, a lot of that is really the upper management. You feel what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, it's sad, but that's just reality. Out? Do you still work out? <laughs> I do. Yeah, because you think... House of Athletes, shameless plug. It's, uh, we, we decided that we would get a squat rack put in here so we could work okay, out. Okay, all right, so what else are talking about? The then they'll be like, all right, uh, at least I got All it. right, I think they ain't talking about nothing else, but that is a different perspective. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I, 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 I really do feel like... You have to adapt to what's going on around you. You know what I mean? 
The NFL and NBA are majority black. They're African American. You get what I mean? These people in positions, they're white. You feel what I'm saying? So I just feel like we just have to bridge the gap and have people understand that the times have changed, new things have been put into place, and you got to make sure that your system has evolved and is put in a, in, in, in a better space than what it was. That's all, man. But thank you for watching for tuning in. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe on the video. I love you guys. Peace.